Today I'm going to show you what the Brenizer method is and how to create an image using this process. The Brenizer method is sometimes referred to as Boca Panorama or Bokarama. This technique is similar to the video I made a few years ago on shooting super wide angle shots with a kit lens, but just using a longer focal length and shallower depths of field. If you haven't seen this video yet, click on the eye in the corner or the link in the description. Basically, you take a lot of images and stitch them together to give a wider field of view for a given focal length. When you shoot with, say, an 85 millimeter or longer and at f1.8 or maybe f1.4, you can get a much shallower depth of focus for a given framing. So basically a wide angle shot with a really shallow depth of field. If we look at these next two images, the first one has been taken as a single shot with a 25 mm lens, whereas the second one has been taken with an 85 mm lens, but a lot of images all stitched together. It's pretty much the same framing, but a very different shot. Now, as well as the depth of focus being different between these two images, there are other differences, and these are the size of the file and the time it takes to process. The stitched image is huge and does take a long time to process, especially when using a high megapixel camera on quite a slow computer. But I do think it really makes your images stand out from the norm, and it's well worth the effort and can be a lot of fun when you get it right. This image of my car is over 135 megapixels, and this one of my wife is over 220 megapixels. Now this is how to get images like this. I found it works best when the distance between you and the subject is around about eight to 12 feet, or six to eight foot when the subject is a person or you're photographing a couple. Also with the distance between the subject and the background, you need to make sure this is as far as possible to get that background out of focus. The first thing you need to do is work out the framing and where you want the subject or model. You could shoot with a 25 millimeter to work out your framing and then swap lenses for a much longer focal length. So you know where to start your frame and you know where to end your frame. Next, it's time to work out your settings. You'll be shooting everything in manual. So manual mode, manual ISO and manual focus. Also a fixed white balance is good so the colors don't shift around between shots and RAW will give you much more latitude in editing. Think about how you will be framing your shot and then look for the brightest part in that shot. Then you want to expose for that brightest part. So the sky behind the trees is overexposing in this example and I'll have to make sure this isn't clipping before starting this sequence of shots. If the dynamic range is too high for your camera, you might have to shoot from a tripod and then bracket each shot. This is a more advanced technique, so for now, I'll just show you how to do it with a dynamic range within the limits of the camera. To expose for the brightest part, as we're going for that shallow depth of focus, set the aperture first and set it to the widest that your lens will go. Mine is on 1.8. Then set the ISO to 100 and dial in the shutter speed. If you're shooting in a darker environment and the shutter speed drops below the same number as your focal length, you may have to up the ISO. But where I'm shooting now, it's bright and there's a lot of light about, so I set the ISO to 100 and then dial in that shutter speed. I'll quickly check the histogram and then make sure my zebras aren't dominant in that bright area. This is just to make sure my highlights aren't clipping. I'll have a look around the shot and once I'm happy with the exposure over the whole of the area I'm going to be shooting, I'll set my focus. Here I'm focusing on the side of the cube to try and get as much of it in focus as possible. And then I'll switch to manual focus. It's vital not to knock or turn the focus ring after this point, so make sure you keep your hands away from the focus dial. If it's a static subject like this cube, just start working your way through the shot. I start at the top left and then across, and then work my way down in layers, making sure I have lots of overlap so the computer doesn't struggle too much. And this is the key. As long as you've got lots of overlap, the computer will find it easier to build the image afterwards. Now, if you're photographing a person, you can shoot them first and then build the image up around them. And that's the way I approach it. Now, it's better to get more than you think. 
So shoot more images and go wider than you think you'll need. When doing this technique a few times, I've missed a corner or two and I haven't got quite wide enough. So make sure you do get everything you might want. It's better to get too much and discard a few images than to have bits missing. Also be wary of straight edges and distortion. This cube has a few, so I'll show you what can happen later on when editing. Now, once you've finished the sequence, you can take more sequences or just carry on with your day. When you're done, bring your images back into your computer and import them into your editing software. I use Lightroom and Photoshop. Lightroom to organize the images, and if it's a straightforward stitch, I use the panorama function in that to build that image. And then Photoshop if there are any parts missing or if Lightroom is struggling to stitch them together. Once you have all of your images imported, you need to enable profile corrections in Lens Corrections. So scroll down to Lens Corrections and make sure this is checked. It has automatically selected the right lens for me, but if it doesn't do this, find your lens in the drop down menus. Then make sure all images in your sequence of shots are selected by clicking on the first one, holding down shift and clicking on the last one. They'll all go white like they are in my strip along the bottom. You need to sync these lens corrections, so make sure the first one is selected and then click on sync. If everything is checked in this menu, click check none and check the lens corrections and then click synchronize. This will ensure that all of the images have the right lens corrections, reducing any vignetting that your lens might have. Next, make sure they're all still selected. Then right click on the film strip along the bottom, go to photo merge and select panorama and let the computer do its thing. I normally start with a spherical projection. If that doesn't work, I then go on to cylindrical projection. If you do have any buildings in your shot, you can try perspective, but this often fails for me. Boundary warp often distorts the image in a weird way, so I always leave this on zero. If you check fill edges, if there's not too much to fill, it can work, but I prefer to do this afterwards in Photoshop. With auto crop, I'll also keep this unchecked as I want to crop it myself. I'll also leave auto settings off as I can do this at the end before exporting. Then click merge. Now, depending on your computer's processing power, you might have to wait a while, especially if you're shooting with a high megapixel camera. So this is a time to get a cup of tea. Once processed, it will give you a new image. And if you've shot it like I have, it'll be huge. This is over 28,000 by 14,000 pixels, which is a whopping 392 megapixels. I do have all of these white bits though, so I'll be cropping in on it a little bit. But with all of those pixels, cropping in won't matter one bit. So select your crop tool, which is this little square up here. Make sure the padlock is unlocked and then crop to suit. I'll get rid of the big white bits, but sometimes not all of them. Once I'm happy with a crop, I'll click done or double click the image. Now with this example, if I zoom in, you can see the soft out of focus background However, the one main problem with this one is the distortion, where it's bending the side of the water pool in the foreground. I'll address this later, but first of all, I'll show you how to get rid of these white edges. And for this, we'll have to go over to Photoshop. So right click, edit in Photoshop and wait for it to load. As it's such a big image, it may take a while. Once in Photoshop, select your spot healing brush tool, which as default, will be in the left hand side, but I've just moved everything to the right hand side to make it easier for me. All you're going to do is increase or decrease your brush size with the square brackets on your keyboard and then paint in the missing bits. You might have to go over some parts a few times, but if they're only small sections like this, you can normally successfully fill them in with this tool. Keep doing this until all parts are complete. If you have some tricky parts, it might be worth cropping these out. Otherwise, save the image and go back into Lightroom. Once back in Lightroom, edit the image as normal. Now I've already mentioned it, but the main problem with this shot is the distortion in the foreground. And if you have any straight edges in your shot, be wary of this. I wasn't happy with this one, but luckily I took another sequence further back 
going through exactly the same process when shooting it as well as when editing it and it came out a lot better. I was about 15 to 20 foot away from the cube with this one. It has lessened the effect but the small building is still more out of focus than say if I shot it with a 25mm lens. So here I have the 25mm lens and the Bokorama or Brunizer method shot next to it so you can see the difference. They do look a lot different and when you zoom in you can really see how much the background is out of focus in the stitched image. It is a subtle difference when zoomed out but it does make your subject pop out of that background a little bit more than usual. Now if you've tried and failed with this technique there are normally a few reasons why. For instance like the image that I went through with straight lines make sure you are further back than normal. If you are too close to your subject not only will it distort but it may not all be in focus like this one of my car. If I zoom in the back of the car is out of focus so stepping back and putting more distance between you and the subject will help. But make sure you don't move too far away as the shot will then start to look like a normal panorama like this one. I was around about 30 foot away and this meant that everything started to come into focus. So it really is getting the balance. You don't want to be too far away from the subject but you don't want to be too close either. And this all comes down to experimentation. Also, if everything is on the same plane, like a big landscape far in the distance, you won't really see the benefits of this process. So you need a lot of depth in your photograph. I try and get about six to eight feet between me and the subject, and then as much distance between the subject and the background. Also, if there's anything in the foreground, you can kind of bring that out of focus as well, and that'll add to the depth of the shot. I do this whenever I'm out and about. And even if I've got my wide angle lens with me, I still try and get a shot using this process. However you shoot it, just make sure you are set to manual everything. Then set your focus and set that to manual focus. Then your settings and focal plane will stay exactly the same from the first shot to the last shot. Now if you've tried this technique already, let me know in the comments below how you got on. Or if you haven't, go out and try it and let me know in the comments again. It'll be great to hear how you get on with it. Now to shoot super wide angle shots with a kit lens, click on this next video here. And if you want to shoot handheld panoramas, click on this next video down here. And if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe for weekly videos every Monday and Thursday. I'll see you next time.